Hi, everyone. Uh, looks like we have 67 people um, already in here. That is great to see. Um, before we officially get started here, um, just wanted to um, put something here in the chat um, about, you know, kind of just the best way to uh, view uh, the webinar. Um, for viewing purposes, we do encourage you to use uh, Google Chrome, uh, we find typically works best as well as if you're on an iPad or iPhone, uh, the Demio app for iOS devices uh, is gonna work best for that. I uh, just put some information in the chat all about that. Um, so, you know, if you are experiencing um, difficulty hearing or difficulty seeing or connecting, um, please go ahead and follow that advice uh, that I just stuck in the general chat here. Um, oh yeah, thank you, Katie, for posting that. Um, cool. Um, so to get started, uh, really excited to have everyone with us today. Um, this is, you know, our first webinar uh, here at Brighter Vision exclusively for uh, AMF team members. Um, so it's uh, just all you joining us. Um, we recently became uh, affinity partners of AAMFT back in, um, I believe it was uh, June of this year. Um, and I actually was out of the conference, so some of you may have ran into me. Um, if you are not familiar with Brighter Vision, basically what we do here, you know, the entire mission of our company is to make marketing uh, simple for therapists. Um, all AMFT members uh, get two months free with us uh, for all web design and marketing packages, so we'd love to have you try us out. Uh, just wanted to say that, get it out of the way. Um, that is, you know, the only pitching I will be doing today. You know, while we do build websites, these webinars are for you. Um, and there, you know, the advice that I'm able to offer, you know, during this webinar is going to, going to apply to, you know, whether you, you know, built a website with us or built a website on your own or built it with another provider. Um, and I just want to cover, you know, really anything that you want to know um, about websites. So with that, I do encourage you to ask uh, questions. Uh, we do have the general chat feature for the webinar, and uh, you can see that uh, it should be on the uh, right side of your screen. Um, maybe to start off, um, where's everybody tuning in from? Um, I'd kind of love to hear from you, um, you know, anybody out in uh, the audience. Uh, okay, South Carolina. We are out here in, um, just outside of Boulder, Colorado. So it's getting a little chilly out here, um, but I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm a big snowboarder, so um, I think the snow is right on the way. And wow, we have people tuning in from all across the United States. This is fantastic. Um, and absolutely love to see that. Um, so cool, we got Seattle, yeah. Even, oh, it looked like we had uh, even somebody from Canada in there. Wonderful. Oh, Seattle was actually just out there. Oh, fantastic. Cool. So, um, yeah, so maybe to kind of just kick things off here, um, wanted to get started, you know, kind of talking about, you know, the basics of, you know, why a website? Why, you know, why, why should you even care about this? Why is having a website even something you want to do with your practice? And, you know, with that, you know, there's a ton of different reasons. But, you know, oftentimes people, the biggest reason that they want to know is, um, you know, because it's going to help them get more clients. So with having a website, you know, it is vital in this day of age, in this day and age, because there's so much information out there. You know, between, you know, going on the internet on a mobile phone, going on the internet on a, um, you know, on a desktop or a laptop, you know, we are overwhelmed with information these days. And because of that, it requires, it requires a lot more different sort of uh, touch points to get in touch with someone, get them to take action. Uh, there is a, I believe it's called the marketing rule of sevens that says, you know, you have to somebody has to see your message seven different times before they're willing to take the uh, sort of initiative to you know, either buy a product or reach out to you uh, with a question about that product. So utilizing your website in that way is gonna be you know, kind of first and foremost, the way that you are going to get in front of people. Specifically when we're looking at websites for you know, therapy practices, a big part of that is also going to be um, you know, making it easy for someone who needs help to access information, uh, first and foremost, schedule an appointment, and then ask you questions. 
Um, so when building a website for your therapy practice, it's you know, pretty vital to keep those first three sort of ingredients in mind, you know, that you need you know, people to easily access information, see what you're about. You need people to have access to easily schedule appointments, and you need people to be able to ask you questions directly from the website. So, you know, keeping that in mind um, going to be important, you know, for, you know, how you develop the website as a whole. Now, when you are thinking about this, you know, besides from just the layout of the site, something that we found here at Brighter Vision in our sort of history of web development, and kind of just to go, you know, back through, you know, what makes me even qualified to talk to you about this? So when I first started at Brighter Vision, um, I was a recent graduate from the University of Colorado, and um, we had started um, building websites for therapists when uh, our CEO and founder, Perry Rosenblum, had built a website for his mother-in-law, uh, who was outside of, but a practice outside of uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So when doing that, you know, we saw that a lot of the websites in the industry, you know, being built in the industry at that time, didn't have a lot of these essential ingredients, you know, easy access to schedule appointments, easy access to information. And it was, you know, a lot of the sites we had noticed were using sort of a, you know, a late 90s kind of style of design. So we came in and kind of updated that. I started as actually as a developer at Brighter Vision. So I was building websites for, um, you know, about a year before I moved more to the sales and marketing side of things. Um, so, and with that, as I've seen our company grow, I've also seen, you know, web design and marketing, you know, in this industry grow as well. And a lot has changed over the years, um, but keeping yourself updated and knowing kind of, um, you know, how to develop a site with, you know, today's, you know, modern internet user in mind is going to help um, really make your site a lot more effective overall. So, you know, with that, one thing that we've really seen um, that's definitely changed here since the beginning is the idea of an ideal client and developing um, sort of an ideal client of, you know, keeping in mind who you want to work with, who you work best with, because if you can do that, you're able to guide the, you know, not just the marketing mission of your website, but the marketing mission of, you know, what you are trying to do overall. Um, and actually, we have a great uh, little worksheet you can do um, to kind of help narrow in um, your ideal client. Um, Katie Hill, uh, our product marketing specialist, is moderating for me. Um, Katie will throw the ideal client worksheet into the chat here at some point. Um, developing, though, uh, that ideal client is going to be, you know, important because it's going to guide, you know, most importantly, the imagery. It's going to guide, you know, the words on your website. It's going to guide and really the entire mission of that site. So when you're kind of thinking about this um, ideal client, um, what you should be, you know, doing is keeping in mind, you know, okay, it's okay if you have a general practice. It's okay if, you know, you have, um, you know, different people you work with. But what we have seen is in order to make, you know, your marketing most effective overall, it's a good idea to keep in mind one or two people that are going to resonate best with your message because it really does a great job of focusing the website, focusing the web design. So we can talk more, you know, about that later, but maybe before I move forward, were there any questions that anyone had kind of just first and foremost, things that they wanted to know about web design that were important to them, things that, you know, you had just never gotten a chance to ask someone. Um, if you want to put that in the general chat, I am happy to answer any and all questions as we go along. You know, I have some talking points um, I can go over, but you know, what I really want is to hear from you and know, you know, what you're curious about, what you need help with, um, and you know, how I can assist. So, sip of coffee here. So cool. So I guess um, what we'll start off here with is, you know, the very basics of web design. So. Um, the first couple things that you, you know, need to know. Um, so there's some big pieces of web design. It, it, the first big piece is going to be your uh, domain name. So the domain name is the website address, um, or, you know, as some people call it. Um, and that would be something like the .com, 
or the dot org. Uh, for picking a domain name, we, we typically recommend a dot com domain name. That's the gold standard. You know, there are other situations where you can use a dot org. Now, a lot of nonprofits use dot orgs, but for a private practice, we do encourage uh, you to use a dot com. Um, as that is you know, kind of the gold standard of domain names. So domain name is basically the street address for your website. Uh, if you want to think about it, you know, kind of like a house, and it's an analogy that we uh, like to use, because it makes a lot of sense. Um, so that also brings us to hosting. So the domain name, that's gonna be your street address. The hosting is gonna be the actual you know, plot of land that you're able to build the website on. So, you know, similarly, how you have to buy a plot of land to build a house, you have to purchase hosting to be able to build a website. Because without hosting, you're not going to be able to have the website online. People aren't going to be able to come over to your house um, and find it with that address. That's the domain name. So that's going to be the hosting. A lot of hosting, typically, you know, if you're going to go out and purchase hosting on your own, is going to be you know anywhere from about ten to twenty dollars a month typically. Most website providers um, that you know allow you to create a site on your own or they create a site for you um, include hosting. With the overall cost, for example, like Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, they're all going to cover the hosting um, as a part of you know their ongoing subscription. Um, you can purchase hosting on your own, but I will say it's kind of getting less and less common. So we have the domain name, we have the hosting, and then we have the website itself. So the website itself, that's gonna be everything that a user sees. That's going to be the imagery, that's going to be the individual pages, that's going to be um, you know, what's ultimately gonna be viewable. And all of that content is gonna be built on top of the hosting platform. So everything within your website um, you will build that house on your plot of land or your hosting provider, um, if you will. So those are kind of just the, the basic three terms um, that I like to um, cover. And I will actually get to uh, these questions here. Um, so cool. So um, we had a couple of different questions. So. So yeah, and the webinar is going to be one hour, uh, Sarah, and uh, just as a heads up, if anyone has to head out early, the webinar uh, will be publicly available um, to watch later. Um, so, you know, a, a recording will be sent to everyone uh, that will be up uh, indefinitely. So, cool. So, um, Brittany had a question um, up first here about ethics and logistics behind SEO, Google AdSense, et cetera. So, when we are talking about you know, ethics and logistics behind SEO, you know, ultimately, you know, your mission as a therapist, as a clinician, is to help more people. So in my you know, professional opinion, there really shouldn't be a ethical dilemma behind optimizing your website for the search engine, because ultimately your whole goal is to help more people, to see more people, and be able to help people with the issues they're seeing. That in itself is a very ethical thing, in my opinion. And I, and I think, you know, part of the reason why we're in this business is to help, you know, therapists and help clinicians see more people. Um, so optimizing your website for search engines is going to, you know, make a lot of sense and, you know, help you grow your business, help you see more people. With Search engine optimization and advertising on Google, it's important that we do split up the, um, that topic into kind of two subtopics because there is one, organic SEO, and then two, um, there is pay-per-click advertising. So organic search engine optimization is going to be uh, what we do on site. So that's going to be writing titles and descriptions in your website which essentially uh, what they do is they communicate the language of your website back to Google and they allow you to um, be found online. We actually just published a uh, pretty great guide on you know, all of the different sort of topics regarding search engine optimization and pay-per-click advertising. Uh, Katie, could you put that in the chat for everyone, um, the, um, the SEO glossary that we just published? 
Um, but with that, so you're looking at organic search engine optimization. Organic search engine optimization doesn't cost anything. That's going to be something that, you know, a, you know, you may pay a web designer to do this and you may pay them an hourly fee, but there's no ongoing fees that you're charged by an organization to have your website, you know, pulled up in search results. So for example, if somebody's typing, you know, therapist in, you know, in Boulder, Colorado, just to use, you know, our kind of local town here as an example, um, you know, if your site has been properly optimized and it's, you know, um, been around for a couple of years and, you know, you've had your business for a couple of years, there's a really great chance that your website would be appearing in that organic search result. Somebody enters in uh, a phrase, you pop up. Now, um, search engine optimization and organic search engine optimization takes time to build. It takes time to be able to have that relationship with Google. And that's when, um, you know, a lot of companies, um, you know, including us here at Brighter Vision, we look into pay-per-click advertising. So pay-per-click advertising is formally sort of taking out an ad uh, with Google and paying every time somebody clicks on that ad. So it, to you know, make things nice and simple, pay-per-click advertising is a way that you can basically, um, you know, kind of jump to the front of the line, if you will. Now, you know, with pay-per-click advertising, that is going to be more expensive because you, you know, you got to keep in mind that you are paying per click. Um, a typical sort of setup fee for what I've seen for pay-per-click campaigns is around, uh, for at least private practices, is around $1,000 to set up. And then you probably want to set a budget of at least, you know, two to $300 uh, a month to pay for those ads. So that's why, you know, especially for private practices, you know, what we focus here at Brighter Vision is on organic search engine optimization. Because when we build that relationship with Google, it can do a really, really good job at getting your website um, seen by the people you're looking to help. And as long as you are, you know, creating content um, that relates to your business, relates to who you are trying to help, you know, you can maintain that relationship over time. So, um, Cool, so I will get to some other questions here. Uh, Jessica got some question, a question about, what is your position on posting fees on a website? So Jessica, I think that you know, it is a very wise decision to post your sort of basic fee on the website. You know, I think it is, you know, it is totally okay if you have a sliding scale, you know, what I see most of our clients do that works best for them is they do their sort of general fee. Hey, this is what you are going to have to pay, you know, if you don't use insurance, you know, say $150 per session. And then, you know, they might mention, hey, you know, mental health on that same uh, page that listed the fee, they might, you know, mention, hey, mental health is important. If you, you know, can't afford my you know, services, a sliding scale is available please contact me uh, and I'm happy to talk about that with you. And I see that's a really, you know, kind of great way to organize it because, you know, then you're able to have an honest, you know, conversation with that person, you know, find out, you know, what they, you know, what they could pay and, you know, see if, um, you know, you can work something out without, you know, offering a discounted rate that everybody's going to want to take advantage of right off the top of your head. So uh, I think it is essential to, you know, list your fees on the website. Um, Deborah had a question about how do you find a hosting company? Um, so to find a hosting company, um, you know, if you are trying to build the website on your own, um, you know, I would personally suggest, you know, Wix or Weebly or Squarespace. Those companies all include hosting with, um, with their basic subscription. If you wanted to build a website on WordPress, um, WordPress is basically in, um, without getting too technical, it's basically a platform that you can build websites on pretty easily, but they don't include hosting. So you would, would have to go to another hosting company. Um, some easy ways to do that, um, I encourage you to look into Bluehost, as well as uh, GoDaddy does uh, now offer hosting and a website building platform. Um, all in one along with domain uh, name registration. 
So cool. And those are the kind of the companies that I would recommend um, for that. Um, Bluehost and then uh, GoDaddy if you're trying to build the site on your own and not going with one of the all-in-one uh, website builders. Okay, so uh, Denisha had a question. My target audience is military and maternal mental health. How can I use colors and advertise to men and women equally? I'm looking for a brand that fits both. So that is a great question, and quite frankly, it is one that can be you know, kind of complicated. So, you know, the first option is, you know, you create two separate websites. Now, you know, I know that that is, you know, not ideal um, because it would look like you also had two different businesses. Um, and, you know, it's also not ideal because, you know, if that is the same business, you know, it's going to get very confusing very quickly. But there is a way that you would be able to, um, you know, integrate a brand that's going to um, be reflective of both of these groups. So I think a big way that you would do that is to be, you know, to use sort of neutral tones. Don't do anything that's too, you know, that's too gendered, um, you know, that, you know, use sort of neutral tones and, you know, pictures of families, things that could go either way. But I think even, you know, kind of narrowing down this, um, you know, maybe you want to think about making your um, making your ideal client to be military families, you know, because that could be reflective of, you know, both military and maternal mental health. If you say, hey, I offer support, I offer services for military families. Um, and that way, you know, looking at that ideal client, you're able to you know, really address both of those different groups. Um, so that may be something worth considering. Um, as well, um, you know, the content for you is going to be very important. So you're going to have you, you're going to have a, have to want. Uh, sorry, <laughs> tripped over my words a little. You're going to want to create uh, different service pages for each and every one of the groups that you serve and the different issues that you can help them with. So, for example, you're going to want a services page that is. Um, you know, that uh, talks about helping people um, and veterans with PTSD. Um, then on the flip side, um, you are going to want a specific services page that can speak to, um, you know, something like postpartum depression or, you know, all of the different sort of facets of, you know, maternal mental health that you um, can help people with there. So um, first and foremost, you know, I think look at that ideal client who you're trying to speak to. And then second, you know, make sure you're creating uh, content that is going to, you know, be able to uh, be reflective of, you know, any of the populations you're looking to reach. Uh, one note on content since we're on this. Um, when you are thinking about creating different services pages on your website, it's going to be important to be as specific as possible and to be able to have different services pages that, um, talk about each specific issues as opposed to one general services page that just lists, lists out every possible thing that you can help out with. The reason for that is going to be search engine optimization. Uh, the more pages that you have about specific things that you offer, the more your web developer is going to be able to write search engine optimization for each and every one of those pages and the better chance you have to get found online. Um, so Vivian had a question, what are the most important things you want on your website? So most important, I would say by far, um, and I can say, you know, basically this in one answer, it is going to be calls to action. Calls to action are the most important thing that you can include in your website. And calls to action can be a number of different things. A call to action can be a link to your phone number. It can be a contact form for people to ask questions. It can be a link to your online calendar to have them schedule a session. But creating calls to action and putting them in strategic locations throughout the site is going to enable somebody who lands on your site to know that they can get to you and they can reach you and they can you know, reach out to you in less than 10 seconds. Um, and utilizing those calls to action, you want to, you know, Keep them in mind to put them in different locations on your site 
So keep in mind that people are often going to be reading from left to right, and then they're going to read, you know, top down. So, you know, for example, a lot of times what we do with our different websites is Brighter Vision, we always have a call to action, uh, typically in the upper, um, in the upper left corner and the upper right corner, and then um, another couple of calls to action on the center of the screen. So they read left to right, and then as they scroll down, they have more calls to action, whether that's, um, you know, a phone number to call or whether that is a, um, um, a contact form or something like that. So, um, Vivian, that's going to be kind of my number one. Federico had a question, um, how to market or publicize a home delivery service, counseling and clients home rather than your own home. So with that, you know, I think it's important, you know, if that is a service that you offer, um, you are going to be looking for maybe people who are, you know, they live in remote areas or rural areas um, and they need someone to drive to them to see them. Um, I think, though, that, you know, that is, you know, important that, you know, if you offer that service, it's important to put that front and center on your website. So on the first page, let's say you have a banner image, um, you would want to have a, um, you would want to have a, you know, announcement that sort of says, um, in-home counseling services, something like, you know, I come to you. Um, and then have a picture that's sort of reflective of it. That's clearly, you know, maybe a, you know, or maybe it's even you, maybe you could get a photo shoot of you in a client's home and have that as sort of the big banner image on your homepage with that text over it. I think just kind of starting there, that's going to be a you know, great place to start. Okay. Um, and also, so I know there was another uh, question about um, how to get your website to be high, you know, slash visible on website, uh, and Lynn had asked that question. So Lynn, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, search engine optimization. Um, and, you know, that is what you're going to need to be able to, um, you know, have your website ranking on Google. You know, my suggestion um, is for search engine optimization to, um, you know, make sure you either get someone to write that for you or write it on your own. Um, what I can do here actually after this um, webinar is over um, is uh, Brighter Vision actually has an SEO course that we uh, typically only offer to our customers. Um, but, you know, we you know, really love, you know, kind of working collaboratively with AMFT and all of, um, you know, and all of you. So um, what it will do is I will actually get that added to the show notes for our show today. Um, and we'll be able to give everyone access to that SEO course. Uh, so if you're kind of curious about, you know, some more in-depth stuff, about search engine optimization, um, we can give you that um, for free as uh, AMF team members. Um, with that, uh, I just want to kind of just add uh, one point to Lynn's question, um, and that is something that um, is um, it doesn't deal as directly with uh, search engine optimization as it does with Google My Business. Uh, if you're not familiar with Google My Business, um, basically what that is. Um, is it creates a business listing so that you are listed on Google's map of businesses um, in the area. Uh, we actually wrote a really great article about how to take advantage of Google My Business, um, and uh, Katie will go ahead and link that in the chat. Um, but one important thing about Google My Business is, so you can put a office location on there, but what we have found, it's actually better to set a service area on Google My Business and um, and it can be you know better in certain circumstances. For example, you know back to uh, Federico's question, I believe it was where you don't have one thing locked, you have an area. So in that sense, it would be better to set a service area as opposed to an office location. Um, now, you know if you do have a traditional office and that's the only place you practice out of, you'll still want to put your address there. But for anybody who's doing online counseling or who's doing a sort of uh, service area, um, 
um, you are going to want to set a service area on Google My Business as opposed to a specific office address. Okay, Patty had a question about uh, connecting website to a EHR, so an electric health record system. So, Patty, so there is a couple different ways to do that, depending on which EHR you're using. Um, Simple Practice, who we work with here at Brighter Vision, they actually offer a scheduling widget that can be embedded directly into your website so that someone who comes to your website wouldn't actually need to, you know, uh, have a login to your EHR or your electronic health record system, um, and they can just set up a time that way. However, the way that most um, EHRs work is they require each customer to, you know, create basically a profile, and then, you know, as the uh, therapist, you have certain uh, administrator access to be able to take notes, to be able to build them, things like that. So what we typically do is, um, you know, here at Brighter Vision at least, is link your client portal to the website so it's listed right on the website in a prominent location so that an existing client can go, they could click on, you know, client portal login and they can easily log in. So what I would suggest is um, go to whoever your EHR is, contact their support department and ask them for the link to your client portal. And then you or your web developer would basically go and they would link that client portal to a button somewhere on the website. So Winnie uh, had a question about, uh, can you explain more about how to decide on the hosting company? So Winnie, with deciding on a host company, you know, it's quite honestly, there really isn't a lot there. Um, you know, hosting is literally just sort of the land that your website lives on. So, you know, I, you know, if you are needing more support with, you know, than just hosting, let's say, you know, you don't want to do security on your own. Let's say you don't want to do, um, you know, you don't want to build certain parts of the site on your own. My suggestion is go with, you know, somebody who does everything for you. So for example, um, you know, here at Brighter Vision, we basically provide the hosting. We get your website online. We take care of that for you with, um, Wix or Weebly or Squarespace, they provide the hosting. You do have to build the website on your own, but they really automate the process of hosting so you don't have to go buy it somewhere else. Um, I do think one of the hardest parts of building a website on your own is kind of figuring that out. But there's a lot of great services nowadays that just kind of take care of all of that for you and wrap it into an all-in-one package. And my suggestion is, you know, if unless you are experienced with building a website, you know, that's going to kind of be your best bet is, you know, an, an all-in-one company that includes the hosting along with either website building software or along with a development team that's going to build the site for you. Larry asked, uh, I am licensed in four states. How can I show up in each state? Great question, Larry. So this is a uh, question we get all of the time. Um, so I imagine, um, you know, probably you practice primarily out of one state and then maybe do all nine counseling in the other states. So um, one thing that you can do um, to start showing up in every state, you know, so um, with an online practice, with, especially with an area that large, it may be helpful for you to look into Google AdWords. Uh, in that case, that is one time that I, you know, maybe would uh, recommend taking up some paid ads just in, you know, targeting each of these different states. Another thing that you can do is you know create a different page for um, each of the um, each of the different um, each of the different states you practice in. So let's say you practice in you know um, just off the top of my head um, you know let's say you primarily practice in Pennsylvania, um, but you can also see people in New Jersey, Maine, and New York. So you could have different services pages that say online counseling in. New Jersey, online counseling in Pennsylvania, online counseling in New York, online counseling in Maine, to show that you can see people in all of those states. Uh, and then your um, web developer can go in and write uh, search engine optimization for that. Valerie had a question. Uh, my practice is generally full. Is it all right to not have a page for setting up appointments or better to have a calendar function that shows all hours are full? So Valerie, I would say, in that case, um, 
I would encourage you to maybe not have that page for setting up appointments, but having a just a general sort of form on the website that was an appointment request form. Um, so if you did have room, um, you could have that person, you know, basically submit an inquiry to you. Um, and then you could see if you could fit them in. If not, um, you know, you have kind of two options from there. Option one is you refer them to another therapist. Option two, and if you're okay with it, is having a wait list. Um, you know, we have found, you know, as, you know, as it can be, you know, just from like the clinical side, what I understand, um, a little bit problematic to have a, a wait list for people who are waiting to get help. Um, it can be helpful from a business perspective, just, you know, when times, you know, get slow, for example, during the summer, I know that summer is typically a downtime uh, for therapists when everybody's off, everybody's on vacation, everybody's feeling good. Um, and um, a lot of times uh, the clients we work with are looking to grow their practices in the summer. So, um, you know, to have that wait list in place, you know, it's not a terrible thing from a business perspective. And also, I guess, keeping in mind that, you know, that person is reaching out to you because they want to see specifically you or they want to see, you know, a, you know, if you're in a group practice, that specific clinician in your practice. So um, it can be, you know, okay to have a wait list. So. Rachel had a question. Do you recommend creating a name for a practice or using one's own name? This extends to the website name. So uh, this is actually another question I get a lot and I've gotten a lot over the years, Rachel. My suggestion, first and foremost, is if you have a, you know, if it's a newer practice and it's a solo practice, meaning it's just you at this time, my typical recommendation is start with your name. Start with, um, start with your name as the business name. Um, you know, just, you know, Rachel, then your last name, Therapy. Um, and the reason for that is to, you know, get people to start building, you know, um, and so as people start getting recognition of you, and then if a, another clinician or, you know, somebody you've worked with previously um, or a group practice refers someone to you, they can easily look up your name and find you um, as opposed to having your name affiliated with a business name. Now, what I see a lot of our clients do and what I think works well is as your practice grows, uh, you might come to a point where you want to transition to a business name. And my suggestion for that is when um, you start working with additional clinicians, let's say you hire two new people, at that point it's probably a good idea to transition to a business name um, to you know, sort of include everybody in that overall brand. Now, you would still want individual pages for each of the new clinicians that you hired on your site that gave bio information about them uh, and then have services pages for them that let people know who they see. But at that point, I, I do say it's a good time to transition to you know, having a business name. I think at the beginning, uh, especially if you are a solo practice, um, it's better just to have, you know, you use your personal name uh, for the business. So James had a question. Can you discuss the relevance slash importance of utilizing podcasts in conjunction with a viable website? So um, James, I think it's actually a great question. This is um, something I didn't have a ton of information about until um, we had actually hosted a podcast with uh, Joe Sanic of Practice of the Practice. I don't know if any of you are familiar. Um, he um, has, uh, we've done a, a lot of work with him over the years. And he actually gave a great presentation last week um, on our webinar uh, last week. And um, Katie will uh, link that in the description, our webinar uh, last week with Joe. Uh, we are still in the very early stages of podcasting. It may not seem like it, but it is true. Um, you know, you seem, you know, you know, they, it feels like you're inundated with podcasts, but, you know, it's still a very new medium compared to something like even YouTube. You know, YouTube has, you know, is having its heyday right now where you see, you know, millions of dollars uh, being given to, you know, YouTube um, influencers and people have channels on there. Uh, with podcasts, we're still kind of in the early days of that. And there's a lot of good things that you can do with podcasts um, to, you know, help your therapy practice, even if you're not monetizing that podcast. So the biggest thing that I see there is, you know, reinforcing your expertise uh, as a clinician, as somebody, you know, 
who other therapists want to refer to. Um, because by having that podcast, you establish yourself as the expert. And it's a really great thing for your overall brand. If they could say, oh, hey, James has a weekly podcast where he talks about, you know, mental health issues and how to, you know, help people in, you know, all of these different ways, you know, and leverages his experiences of, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it might be, um, to, you know, have these discussions that are, you know, free for anyone to look at. And it's also an additional, you know, way to, you know, spread your brand. Um, so I do think having a podcast is, you know, something that can be, you know, super, super beneficial. Uh, here at Broad Division, we have a podcast, uh, the Therapist Experience Podcast. Our CEO hosts it. Um, it's been great for us. Uh, we give it away for free. Um, and it's um, something that's really cool when somebody, you know, comes up to us at a conference or they, um, you know, contact us to start a website and they say, hey, I heard, I heard you on uh, the Therapist Experience podcast and, you know, love the advice that you gave out and uh, just knew that I wanted to work with you. And that same thing can apply to a, um, you know, can apply to a therapy practice. So Sheila had a question, will this presentation be repeated? Um, so I don't have plans for that to repeat this specific this specific uh, presentation. But if you uh, and if anyone really likes this and they would like to, um, you know, request basically that I do the same sort of website 101 conversation again, uh, email me. Uh, my email I will put in the um, chat right now, and um, feel free to email me. I love to have feedback about these kind of events. And if this, you know, if you didn't get a question answered or um, there's something you were thinking of after this event um, that, you know, you think we could, you know, talk about again, we could do a whole nother hour again, totally open to that. Um, our whole goal for AMST members is we want to do one of these webinars a quarter. So I would love to get, you know, anybody's feedback about things they want to hear out, uh, advice that you have for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I accept, you know, all feedback, good or bad. So feel free to uh, send me a direct email. So uh, Francesca asked a question. Can you discuss the significance of social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, when advertising your practice slash website? So Francesca, this is a kind of whole new world. Um, social media marketing for private practices. Um, there is, you know, a school of thought basically in the past that said, you know, your, you know, your individual self and your um, therapy practice, um, you know, have to be kind of two separate things. I would say in the age of social media, those things are sort of coming together. Um, in a way that they haven't in the past, specifically for the mental health industry. Um, as a, you know, kind of general thing to think about is, you know, people do business with those they know, like, and trust. Um, and with social media, um, that's a great way to have people get to know you. Um, you know, now, you know, you don't want to be, you know, discussing super personal information on there, obviously. Um, on a you know Facebook uh, page for your business, but it's a great way to share you know things like helpful articles or talk about things that are going on that may be stressing people out. Whether it's a upcoming election, whether it's the holiday season, uh, to show people that you know you think about these things too and you want to help them um, is a great way to start kind of building a social media presence. Um, with marketing on social media, it can be hard. Um, you know, we do, um, you know, just to kind of throw it in there, uh, Brighter Vision does offer a social media service called Social Genie um, that we offer a 14-day free trial of that actually creates a lot of the content for you already. Um, and it links automatically your website and includes your logo on that. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, I would suggest that when you are posting on social media, um, you know, put some kind of helpful information, whether it's a link to a blog on your website, whether it's a link to um, another website with helpful information. You know, it's important for social media, I, especially I think in the mental health space, to make sure it, it's not just fluff, but to make sure it provides you with real information um, that, um, you know, shows that you are, um, you know, there to help. Uh, so Jackson had a question um, that I want to get to, because this is a good one. 
So I've been having a, a really hard time getting started on my website. It feels a bit overwhelming. If I wanted help with it, who do I ask and what are the typical rates? Or do you have advice for small steps getting started? So Jackson, there's kind of two different things you know, to think about, or actually, you know, really just one thing to think about is, you know, do you want to do it yourself? Do you have the time to do it yourself? Um, or is it something that you want somebody to do for you? Now, you know, I meet, you know, especially so, you know, my age, I am 27. Um, a lot of the people I know my age and actually know, um, and I started to know a lot more um, clinicians my age in private practice, a lot of them are comfortable building sites on their own because, you know, maybe they built the website in college for a project or something like that, um, or they have, you know, some kind of experience in web design previously. Um, and they say, hey, you know, I want to learn this. Um, you don't have a big budget for it. I think I'm just going to go ahead and try and build a site on my own. I would say, you know, if you are having a hard time and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, um, it's really helpful to have someone there who you can talk through uh, the development process with. Um, you know, either that could be, you know, maybe a freelancer in your local area. Uh, if you go on a website called Upwork, uh, they have a lot of, um, you can basically um, say, hey, I need help building a site. Um, Here's my proposed budget for this. Um, what I would encourage, though, is you know, maybe take a look at our service at Brighter Vision. Um, our service is $59 a month. Um, we pair you up with a development team who is there with you every step of the way and allows you to build the site um, and you know, ask questions and kind of bounce ideas back and forth. But either way, you know, if you didn't go with us, my suggestion is you know, get somebody who's experienced, get somebody who you can talk to and is going to help you uh, help you through it, I, I think is the best, um, the best, my best suggestion if you are feeling overwhelmed. Okay. Okay, so we have some great other questions in here. Um, definitely want to try and get to them all. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes left, but I'm actually okay running over. I don't have a ton on the agenda after this today, so um, I will try and get to all the questions. Uh, Nora had a question, is blogging a useful marketing tool? So, Nora, yes, uh, blogging is a great tool to have. And uh, the benefit of blogging is going to be kind of uh, multifaceted. So the first uh, helpful thing about blogging is it establishes you as an expert in the field. Uh, the same way with the question earlier, how we talked about how podcasting uh, can be helpful to establish you as an expert in your field and lead to more referrals, lead to more people wanting to see you. You can do the same thing with blogging. Um, the other piece with blogging is that it gives you content to share in a HIPAA compliant way that you could send out in a newsletter that you could post to your social media pages that links back to your, um, to your website and, you know, where people are encouraged to schedule a consultation with you. But um, you're able to do that in a way that, you know, isn't overly invasive, but just, you know, gives people information uh, that can be helpful. So we have some more questions. So um, Angie uh, had a question about how do, uh, how do you assist someone who already has a site? So uh, I imagine you're probably talking about us here at Brady Vision. So um, we do offer some options if um, you wanted to you know, transfer the website over to us. Uh, every Brady Vision plan does include unlimited technical support. Um, basically, we take care of the updates for you. We also manage the search engine optimization for you. Um, if that's something you're interested in learning more about, uh, feel free to um, send me an email directly. As well as if anybody else is interested in our service, feel free to um, send me an email directly. Uh, I'll try and get to some of the more specific questions about, you know, kind of just general web design stuff. So um, we make the best use of everybody here at time. Uh, but I do encourage you to um, email me directly if you have specific questions about Brighter Vision Service. How do you go about creating a brand? Uh, Melissa asks. So, great question. Um, so, and we actually did a uh, pretty cool webinar about this uh, with Kate and Kate, uh, Katie and Kate Campbell from the Private Practice Startup. Creating a brand is something that can be um, kind of tricky just because there's so many, you know, different facets of a brand. You know, I would say, first and foremost, 
when you're creating a brand, it's important to ask yourself why. You know, why, why have you chosen to start a private practice? Why have you chosen to go into, um, you know, practicing mental health in the first place? By first asking yourself why, what you're able to do is understand, you know, what, you know, the reason for, you know, doing all of this in the first place. And I think that authenticity, you know, if you can first reflect inward is, you know, really impactful because it makes people want to see you. It makes people, you know, know you and trust you. Um, I also think when you are creating a brand, um, it is important after you ask yourself why to determine who your ideal client is, to understand who you are going to connect with, and everything from there can kind of fall into place. You know, it's, it's also important to keep in mind that a brand isn't a, it isn't a static thing. You know, it's going to grow, it's going to evolve over time, whether that's your personal brand or whether that is your company's brand, things are going to change over time. You know, I suggest first and foremost um, for creating a logo, think of what you're trying to say with the logo. Think of what you're trying to say to your to the client you are looking to reach. Think about their struggles, what they're going to, what they're going through, what they're going to relate to best. Um, and if you have that in mind when you know working with someone or creating a brand on your own, I think it's really going to help guide all of that. So Lauren asked a question: What are your thoughts about including an inclusivity statement on your website? specifically in an area where certain populations are not accepted. So Lauren, I think that that is a great idea. I think that is something you should absolutely be doing on your website. So one of my personal favorite um, clients that I've worked with here at Brighter Vision, when I was still you know, actually building the websites in a day-to-day -day fashion, um, is um, a woman with us um, named uh, Tamara Powell, and she was actually on our podcast. On her podcast, so she serves a very rural area of Florida, a place that's not uh, really accepting of, you know, uh, the LGBT community. And she came forward with her website and her marketing and said, hey, you are welcome here. I am going to, you know, I want to help you. I want to see you. You know, I, you know, my practice is a very inclusive one. I think doing that and even thinking about that as, you know, a part of your um, overall brand is something that's great, you know, to be inclusive about who you serve. Uh, one of the, you know, my personal favorite companies that, you know, Brighter Vision has worked with uh, the past couple, six months is a company called Therapy Den. Therapy Den, basically what they do is um, they are like psychology today, but they include all of these different filters regardless of, you know, um, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of any of the number of factors, they have all of these different sort of uh, ways for somebody to find a therapist who they are going to connect best with. And inclusivity is a big part of their brand. It's right on their home page. And they have absolutely, um, you know, taken off as a directory because of it, because they have, you know, that inclusivity is built directly into, you know, what they do. So I would really encourage you to you know, include that on your website. And I think that that's, uh, that's really, really important. So um, Evie had a question about um, kind of Brighter Vision service. Evie, if you could email me directly, that would be awesome. Uh, it's Sam C at Brighter Vision. Um, and um, I'd be happy to answer kind of any questions you have about that. So. Carolyn had a question about um, geofencing um, and about, you know, kind of the benefits of that. So I actually am not as familiar with geofencing. Um, I think that that is going to be something that, you know, we'll have to look into and write maybe some content about it. Maybe Katie knows um, better about geofencing than me and she could link something helpful. I actually don't you know, know a ton about that topic at this point. I assume that that's like uh, targeted maybe messages in an area, um, but I'm not, you know, unfortunately not terribly familiar with that. So, um, 
So, um, cool. So um, a lot of great questions here today. And I thank everybody for the question. I think this was fantastic. Um, and like I had said, um, you know, any feedback that you have about the webinar, anything else that you, you know, want to know about, you know, marketing, send that to me. Um, we'll be doing another one of these uh, webinars exclusively for AAMFT members, uh, again, in most likely February. Um, and the topic is totally up in the air. It's whatever, you know, um, members want to know about, um, you know, within, you know, the marketing sphere, because that is our specialty here. But anything about marketing you want to know, we're happy to, um, you know, set up a webinar uh, for everyone. So, uh, can you uh, monetize your blog or podcast, uh, Brittany asked. So, um, yes, I mean, absolutely. You are, um, you are totally open to monetize a blog or podcast. Um, and I think that that is, you know, something okay to do. I would suggest, you know, if you're really thinking about monetizing a podcast and that's something you want to do as an additional stream of revenue, I would encourage you to set it up as a separate business that's not directly affiliated with your therapy practice. Just from a you know, legal and ethical standpoint, I think that that's gonna be your best option. Um, we have a client here, uh, Shane Burkle, who has a website with us um, for his private practice, but he also has a separate site for his podcast because he does do some you know, advertising on that podcast. And the podcast actually doesn't even really relate to his, um, doesn't even really relate to his um, uh, practice as much. It's something different. It speaks directly to therapists, where his um, website is speaking directly to you know individual clinicians who need help. Um, and um, with that, Brittany, I would say um, the blog, um, if it is you know, kind of speaking to a different uh, you know a different uh, demographic, um, separate it out. But if it's speaking to like your ideal client, keep it on there. Okay, you get a question. Uh, does it matter where the photo of the therapist appears? Does it have to be on the front page or can it be the about me or another page? So Evie, um, I say, you know, it, um, you don't have to have a photo of yourself on the front page. Um, most of our customers actually do not have their photo on the front page. Um, on the about page, on the about me page though, it is super important. Uh, we actually have a great course that's totally free about creating an about me page. Uh, Katie can link that in the uh, description here. Uh, Denise had a question. Is it illegal to sell merchandise with your brand logo on your site like coffee mugs? Uh, not at all. Um, so um, we actually have one of our clients actually just got back from her conference out in Anaheim. Um, her name is uh, Mercedes Samudio. So she is a therapist and clinician. Most of her work is with parenting and children. Um, and she sells um, a really great book, um, and actually a couple of different books on her site uh, with us, and there's no, um, no real uh, conflict there, to my knowledge. You know, full disclaimer, um, any of the stuff there, I am not a lawyer, I would check with your um, lawyer or you know, see what um, you know, kind of would go on there, but from my experience, I think you're probably okay. Um, Patricia asked a question, HIPAA sites recommended. So Patricia, absolutely. Uh, we do recommend you should be HIPAA compliant as much as possible with the website. Um, however, looking at the website, you know, oftentimes the website itself is not what needs to be HIPAA compliant. Um, HIPAA compliancy and what HIPAA compliancy dictates is the electronic communication between you and a client. So you would want to make sure that your uh, communication with them was HIPAA compliant. So to do that, there's a pretty easy way to do that. Uh, and that's going to be having a HIPAA compliant email. Uh, HIPAA compliant email, there's a number of different options. Uh, here at Brighter Vision, we recommend Hushmail. They are a great company. Um, Hushmail, it's really affordable. It starts at just $9.99 a month for their uh, Hushmail for healthcare package. And with that cost, with that, you know, $10 a month, they offer HIPAA compliant contact and appointment request forms. So those forms, so that you can be sure, you know, whether you're sending an email to someone, it's going to be HIPAA compliant, or whether somebody asks a question through your website, it's going to be HIPAA compliant. Um, because if like your contact or appointment request forms weren't HIPAA compliant, um, you would want to typically put a sort of disclaimer 
that says, hey, don't put any personal information in this contact form, um, it's, not, um, it's not a secure uh, form and a secure way to send that. What is the reason for setting up a separate uh, business for a podcast? Education versus therapy. Um, so Shelby, with setting up a separate business for you know a podcast, um, is you know it's basically if your podcast isn't reflective of you know what you do in your therapy business and you're trying to monetize that podcast. Um, I think for you know and the disclaimer again, I'm not a tax professional. But you know, from what I understand, it's better for podcasts um, to um, you know have that separated out. If you're really trying to grow that podcast, monetize and have it be its sort of own entity, um, especially if the topic was different. You know, a lot of podcasts that I see clinicians produce speak directly to clinicians, whereas you know, um, if it was a podcast, um, you know, just about mental health, um, you could keep that on your website and it could. You know, as, as long as it was speaking to your ideal client, it could you know, kind of live there. So, um, well, cool. So I think that I got through all of the questions there. Um, if I didn't get through any questions, please feel free to send me an email, Sam C at Brighter Vision. Um, really want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I had a really great time answering everyone's questions. And um, most importantly, I really appreciate all of your questions. Um, it makes it a lot more fun for me, I think, um, I'm able to, you know, answer, you know, things that you actually want to know, as opposed to just giving, you know, some sort of set presentation. So really, really appreciate all of the great information. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up with the, um, with the helpful resources uh, that we laid out in this podcast, as well as um, a recap video, if you do want to check this out later. Uh, I'll have that out uh, probably by the end of the day today, um, if not a little bit sooner. Um, but yeah, thanks so much everyone for tuning in. Um, also, let me know uh, if there are any topics that you want to know about for our next webinar. Uh, like I said, that'll most likely be taking place in uh, February, once again, exclusively for AAMST members. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your week. Take care.